I want to start with this. It's a comment I heard on your podcast, The Acid Capitalist, about a month or so ago. And you had an investor on that used a line that I've heard a million times. We've all heard it a million times. I'm long equities because over the five-year period, usually equities provide me with a positive return. And you questioned that. And I think we all need to question that in this environment. What did you say back? Well, I mean, it's, it's you know, the Warren Buffett line never short America. And I, I certainly don't want to go against that. But also, it's the, the conceit and the arrogance of a well-formed argument. It is true. There has never been a 10-year ruling period where it's not been the right thing to be long. That doesn't make it right moving forward. You know, there had never been a period where nationwide US house prices had fallen together until it happened. And when it happened, it devastated the global financial system. And today, we're still trapped in the mire of what happened 15 years ago. So you're saying that a century's worth of market data is not long enough? Do you have to take history back a little bit further? Is that how you think about this? No, 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 no. I mean, no, no, this is Asian philosophy. Um, you only free yourself from the shackles of being a slave to market rhythms when you recognize the impermanence of things. Things change. Things like the Fed put, things like the Fed's understanding of money, things like the devotion to Dan in his rather spectacular jacket and his recommendation for Apple. Yeah. Things change. Do you think the Fed's in a policy trap? I think the Fed is confronted with Fed fog. Okay, I mean, again, I keep asking people, when was the last time we, we admired a step taken by the Fed that we thought, wow, yeah, that really has helped my life? Why is the default position to crash the economy? So the hikes are the wrong call? I believe the hikes will not result. They're dealing with a political problem that generated, hey, listen, without a doubt, we have seen an elevation to the tune of 10% in general global prices, right? And that 10% ain't coming back to zero. It's, it's a, but for me, it's an elephant passing through the body of a snake, if you will, right? It refers to a supply shock, okay? There's been, it's gone. We're looking at Amazon's results, okay? Amazon had 100 warehouses full of inventory. Sure. Because they overestimated. And what's, what's your headline again? We're looking at Amazon's worst holiday sales ever okay and the Fed, and we've had two consecutive quarters of gdp decline and the fed saying recession what recession this is a recession is getting bigger and bigger and that's the fog you've picked up on it the mismatch between demand and capacity and there was a clear mismatch in 2020 2021 but it was different we didn't have the capacity we just had tons of demand is it flipped already is that what you're seeing major signs of that that's flipped already and what does that speak to when it comes to the inflation call um, it, it's flipped. I mean, show, show me the evidence in the commodity sector in terms of the higher prices. Yeah? Show me the evidence. Actually, I'll show you the evidence in terms of the household's reaction. There's a default reaction whereby, think of the economy as like one giant wallet, okay? And the, the, the expenditure going out, we know is up 10% right? in general prices, okay? Sure. And so if you maintain your average consumption of goods and services, you need 10% more money coming into the wallet, okay? It, I, I don't see it coming in. This is back to the Friedman notion that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. You need a spigot of 10% coming in to accommodate. If it's not coming in, you're cutting back. Where are you cutting back? On discretionary spending. Let's look at every discretionary stock in the market. Where is it? It's, it's on its ass. So if we start a hedge fund tomorrow and we put together an investor committee, I'd have Mohamed Alirin as the chair to keep us well behaved through the whole meeting. I would have the likes of Drucker Miller there, the ingenuity of Drucker Miller. I'd have the conviction of a 90s Soros. I'd have the discipline of, say, Michael Platt over at Bluecrest. And I'd have you at the end of the table throwing grenades, saying what if. If you could say what if right now, what is the big what if for you? Heavens, you need a joker, yeah. So it's the unintended consequences. And I keep 
looking with a wary eye at our Chinese cousins in France, and I look at their currency. You've got to remember that um, they were allowed to devalue back in 1994 uh, with NAFTA, yeah, to nine. Where is the currency today? It's like knocking on seven and a half, right? It's having, like all currencies vis-a-vis -vis the dollar, it's having one of its weakest, if not its weakest year to date uh, performance. Heaven forbid it trades nine, because that's where the yen is going. You, know, this is a, uh, it's an Aesop fable. Yeah. Why did, the, why did the scorpion sting the frog halfway over? It's a bit like why did Taiwan in 1998 devalue? There was no economic rationale. But when all the mercantilists are devaluing, boom, I can't give it up. That. God forbid that happens. That would be the most deflationary item to ever hit the global monetary system. Is that something you'd be willing to position for right now? Yes. What would that look like? Oh, that's just that, that's a short position in, in the currency. How would uh, you express it elsewhere? Uh, well, you know, elsewhere with restraint, like I keep saying, you don't always have to be invested in markets. People say, give me a safe, give me a, a sure. riskless asset. Well, I, you know, I've lived long enough. I lived through 2008, and the, the safe asset, supposedly, gold, went from near 1,000 to near 500 because we got liquidation. Okay, So for me just now, listen, it used to be, you, you mentioned 2018, 19, the Fed was raising rates, the S&P went down 20%, the Fed went, yeah, I changed my mind. Yep. Right, yeah. Well, we hit 20, we hit 25, the Fed went, no, not this time. So maybe it's 30, maybe it's 35. Okay, My comfort level for trying to own any asset arrives when we pass 35 or 40. You no. said something interesting a moment ago, though. You said many interesting things, but the one was that gold didn't perform. The asset that was meant to perform didn't perform. Is that treasuries right now, or do you think the surprise is still in our future? This is the killing zone for treasuries presently, uh, just chart-wise. Like, this is where, you know, we'll see. Um, either tr the, the tr treasury bond bull market is over, and so yields will continue, or this is the point where we're, j we're just recirculating ownership. But in terms of, let's talk gold, let's talk treasuries, real rates, if we look at five-year uh, tips, are close on 2%. Our system doesn't work, and gold doesn't work when rates are positive. Real rates are positive. Think of it: we've got debt to GDP circa 4x. Okay, if real rates are two, you're effectively transferring 8% of GDP from the debtor class, from the, the household sector, to the creditors, and the creditors have got no idea how to spend money. That's regressive, right? We need financial repression. It's just simple a function of the maths of four times GDP. Did you ever think we'd see an 11 handle on German CPI? Well, we're talking about going back to the 50s. Let's keep going back. Let's go back to 1948 when US CPI was running at 20%. And yet we don't talk about the hyperinflation of the late 1940s. Again, why? Because, mon because inflation is a monetary phenomenon, right? It requires, like, funk. Here we are getting funky in the studios of Bloomberg, sure. right? But it requires funky banks saying, yeah, I want to lend. Do you see that in Europe? I don't see that in Europe, right? I see an elevation in the energy, right? And I see, believe me, right, the blindest bat of the central banking community is the ECB, yep. right? The guys who raised rates in the summer of 2008. And again in 2011. And 2011, and, and what, they just doubled rates yesterday. Hallelujah, right? I, I'm thinking the other way. You think the mistake is what? I think the mistake is they don't understand that money Monetary conditions, they talk about financial conditions, monetary conditions, okay, have superseded their ability to, to see the entire picture. We're talking about the repo market, the euro dollar market. We're talking about where monetary creation is no longer taking place within the, the sovereignty of their realm. They don't see it and, and bad yep. things are happening. The collateral is being called. Okay, yep. money is actually being destroyed. The euro dollar system just now is destroying, is contracting. Money is contracting and it's pushing asset prices down. And it's, it's a reflective system, reflexive system. That's what they don't see. That will be the solution moving forward. Guy, jump in here. Well, uh, I'm curious, Hugh, central bank independence, 
it's, it's a very new phenomenon. And I wonder whether or not we're about to see potentially that being tested as well. Giorgia Maloney in Italy is already questioning the rate at which the ECB is raising rates. She, as you says, you say, talk about the fact that this is a this is a supply side problem that we've got here. It's not a demand issue that you, the eurozone is facing. You've, you've got the French president starting to talk about it as well. Others are likely to follow. How big a clash do you think we could see between politicians and central bankers? And who do you think will win that fight? Well, I, I would extend that outside the European region to, uh, to where you are in the UK. I think you just saw um, a cabo of the Bank of England chief and the jokers at the IMF, forgive me, but, you know, um, ousting the British Prime Minister for having the audacity to suggest a fiscal expansion in a depression. UK prices, the UK stock index is below where it was when we entered this new century, right? It's, it's in a... It's not growing. And what is the answer to raise interest rates? I mean, what planet are these people on? So what do you think the central bank should have done? What should Governor Bailey have done? Accommodate it? be accused of fiscal dominance? What do you think he should have done? Well, let's imagine, let's consider what he did, OK? So, yeah, we're doing quantitative tightening, which itself is just baloney, right? But, you know, we're raising rates and, and we're restricting this supposed uh, money growth, right? And what did he do? He then turned around and said, you know, I said we were, like, restricting money growth. Now we're doing QE again. All right, so there, he, he was the one that pivoted, right? And then what else was happening? It revealed, again, the, the, the repo man revealed himself. The pension funds, who again were deemed to be the smart people, markets disciplining the British government. Well, these disciplinarians were leveraged up to the eyeballs and they were getting margin calls. The system is pulling itself apart. What I believe, Sanity will prevail when a central bank says, I'm cutting rates. We're nowhere near that kind of level, though, aren't we? You know, you talk about a market pushing the central banks to make a move, yeah. to push for a pivot. Where is that level? Where's that threshold? We all agree one exists. Where do you think it is? Well, well again, it, it's when asset prices are down considerably more than they are today, right? It's easy, right? You know, Profound economic recessions are brought on when we lose, when we vaporize 100% asset to GDP ratios. We started this cycle at seven. We're fast approaching five. We don't even have a good mark on private equity, right? So we've lost 200% of GDP already. That was fictional wealth. It wasn't fraudulent. Yeah. We just overstated things, right? But that, that was NASDAQ crash in 1999-2000. That was 2008. Yep. That's all latent. That's all happening now. But it's happening outside the, the, you know, the, the threshold of central banks is like that. And you've got to expand your vision. And when you're out here, you're seeing dead people. So if we've got about 60 seconds left. And I hope you're not actually seeing dead people. Let's finish here. If I could summarize this conversation we've had, you're pushing back quite aggressively against recency bias. And we're all sort of blinded by what's happened recently. Is that the ultimate gist of, of what you're trying to communicate here? It, it is, and I think we have to recognize that all of the fascination, we have, we have to go back 120 years to Germany and the Weimar and the inflation. Why has it not happened here? Because we have fire bricks. We have the outsized position of, of publicly traded debt markets. And they, they reprice immediately, and they tighten policy, not the Federal Reserve. We have discretionary spending where people pull back. That's what's happening. And those two factors together usually mean that the inflation fear remains a fear. And as we move forward, metaphorically, I'm seeing dead people. Okay, <laughs> And the Fed seems to be, that's what the Fed's doing. It has to trash our system. Yep. Once we're all aware of how bad it really is, thank you, Amazon, for again guiding us that way, then the Fed will pivot. Ten seconds to make a trade, literally ten seconds. If you could make one right now, what is it? I, when I look at collateral, I, I, I'm beginning to, again, the, the, the Italian BTP spread versus boons, right? Yeah. Only 15% of boons are in, in market hands, okay? And the Italian is being used as collateral as if it was a boon. Italy is not Germany.